Are you ready for the word? No, are you ready for the word? All right, I believe you. I believe you. Hey, turn on your Bible and go to 2 Kings chapter 6. Turn it on and find 2 Kings chapter 6. I am praying for Dak Prescott, whose foot ended up pointing a different way than it should have. Lord, touch Dak in Jesus' name. That's a real prayer. Um, but 2 Kings chapter 6, let me give you some background here because uh, uh, we're going to parachute in the middle of a situation. In, in 2 Kings chapter 6, you'll find that the king of the Armenians, the Syrians, would always start conflicts with the king of Israel. And several times, he would come up with a plan to ambush uh, uh, certain areas of the border of Israel. Well, as soon as he would say it to his generals, his aides, his advisors, it says as soon as he would say it, Elisha the prophet would hear his plans and he would go and tell the king of Israel. So he was, this happened so often that when the king of Israel got Elisha's word, he would send garrisons and reinforcements to fight off the ambush and it started frustrating the king of the uh, uh, Arameans. And so the king of Arameans thinks he has a leak and his administration, when really they're like, we don't have a leak, that the king of Israel, the nation of Israel, has a prophet in their country. And they even say, he even tells you things, he even knows the things you say in your own bedroom. Come on, that's awkward. I don't care who you are, that's awkward, right? And so he starts getting this frustration level. Why? Because Elisha is a disruption to the wicked plans of a king. Are you with me? Let's read this here. Look at uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. Mm. Let's begin reading verse 8. It says, when, when the king of Syria was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel. Do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to that place indicated by the man of God time and again. So this doesn't happen once. This happened all the time. Time and again, Elisha would warn the king so that he would be on alert there. The king of Syria became so upset over this, he called his officers together and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? Verse 12, it's not us, my lord, the king, they replied. Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Mother of all awkward right there, all right? Verse 13, go and find out where he is, the king commanded so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night, the king of Syria sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning, went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what are we gonna do now? Elisha's servant said. Verse 16, don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more with us than against us. Then Elisha prayed, oh, Lord, Open his eyes. Are you seeing that right there? Oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes and when he looked, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Come on, that must have been a picture. As the Aramean's army advanced toward him, Elisha prayed, oh Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness according to the command of of Elisha. Come on, before we unpack this, let's pray. Come on, pray with me. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I thank you for every man and every woman. Father, I even, I, I speak to this atmosphere and I say that you are full of faith and you are full of hope, and you are full of peace, and you are full of joy, and I come against every limit, every restriction, every blind spot, every failure, every struggle, every demonic harassment, and I say it's broken now in Jesus' name. And I call every one of these men and women into their season. I call them in the strength. I call them into their grace. I call them into their gifting. I call them into their identity. I call them out of their struggle and into their support, God. I call them out of their problems problems and into their purpose. I call them out of their dysfunction and into their destiny. And I push back every wrong word, every untimely word, every fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of humility. I push it back now in the mighty name. You know, I, I, feel, I don't know about anybody else, but I feel so resistant and it's not from you, but I feel so resisted right now 
So Father, I just ask that you would invade even stronger, that you would come in more glory and in more power and in more authority in this moment that you would anoint, that you would consecrate, that you would set apart and I tear down every wall. Lord, I, I rip apart every veil, every addiction, God, every comfort, every idol, I tear it down right now. And I thank you that these men and women are preserved for the things of God. They have been preserved since the beginning of time. They are moved by your spirit and nothing else. They are activated by your word and nothing else. They will not be intimidated and they will not negotiate and they will not alter and they will not run and they will not be full of fear, but let a faith stiffen their spine. Let a feet, uh, a quickness to their feet come on them now. Father, I, I dispatch angels now to come and aid this word. I ask that there would be an increase of the awareness of the presence of God in this room. I break the casualness and let there be a holy interruption tonight. Lord, disrupt the plans of the enemy. Inform on the wickedness of our culture and our day. Inform your people of what you're doing. That we are not walking out of here even more confused. We are not walking out of here with more questions. We are walking out of here with purpose, clarity, and direction tonight. Raise our expectation. Raise our anticipation. We're not looking to news cycles. We're not looking to presidential campaigns. We're not looking to bank accounts. We're not looking to degrees. We're not looking for who's smart and who's relevant. We are looking to the hills where our help comes from. Our focus is on the Lord. Our, our focus is on your hand. Oh, move the hearts of men and women. Move the hearts of kings again. Move the hearts of influencers. Move the hearts of mighty ones tonight. Oh, wake us up. Wake us up in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone shout it. Amen. Amen. I feel like praying tonight. Anybody else? Hey, I got a title for this message. Before I say it, I want you to know this is not culturally, politically, or propaganda motivated. I just thought it was a cool title. The title of the message is called Stay Woke. I, yeah, some of you are like, I get it. Uh, stay Woke. You know, I, I remember one time I was uh, coming out of the gym. In fact, let me be honest and be transparent. I was coming out of a dodgeball tournament. I don't know about anybody else, but I love dodgeball. There's not, especially when you're playing with little kids and you're pounding them with the ball and you throw a ball that weighs more than them and they go flying like this. How I many you know what I'm talking? Don't you judge me like you haven't done that or haven't had thoughts. You know, you got little, come on, you got little brother with your 1,400 people that live in your house and all your cousins and everybody else, right? So like, I remember I was coming out of a dodgeball tournament and I get this text message, fam, on my phone. And this text message says, yo, what's up? And then the next text message come. Is this Darnisha? And then the next text message come, this Antoine from Saturday night. Now that's how I read the text message. Yo, what's up? This Darnisha question mark, this Antoine from Saturday night. Now I promise, I meant to say, George, this is not Darnisha. But the autocorrect on my phone said, this is Darnisha. So Antoine responded back, he said, sup girl. So I didn't have nothing else to do. So I just responded back, nothing, he, 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 emoji, 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 whatever you guys, whatever you ladies say. And I, he, he said, what are you doing? I said, I, I just got out of the gym. I, he said, what are you gonna do after? I said, I'm kinda tired, I'm gonna go to bed. And he, he said, well then you should go to sleep, that's a good idea. I'm like, look at Antoine affirming quality decisions in my life. He's only been in it 30 seconds. So I, I, I you know, I, I, I go shower, I get in bed and, and I remember, Listen, if you know me, I'm an old man. I go to bed like at nine, all right, most of the time. And I wake up 4.35 every morning. It doesn't matter what time zone. I just have always had that habit since high school. But, and everyone on my staff, on my team knows that you don't text me after nine because I'm not gonna answer anyways. So no, my phone never goes off after nine o'clock. Sure enough though, I'm laying in bed, falling asleep. My wife's next to me. She's reading her Bible. She's more of a Christian than I am. And 
and, and I, I remember I'm sitting there and I hear my phone go off and I'm thinking, that could only be one person. So sure enough, with a big smile, I grab my phone and it's Antoine and he's saying, sweet dreams. And I'm thinking, look at Antoine, caring about the condition of my rest. I like this guy. So I, I start responding back and I'm laughing because I'm like, oh, he has no idea, right? So I'm, I, I'm laughing and then my wife says, uh, hey babe, who's that? Uh, I, well, this Antoine. She said, who's Antoine, what does he want? I said, well, he, he want to talk to Darnisha. She said, who's Darnisha? I said, well, I guess I'm Darnisha. And she said, hold up, you're a married man pretending to be a woman talking to another man. I said, baby, when you say it like that, it sounds bad. And she's like, I don't even know how to go to our pastor, Pastor Adam McCain. I don't even know how to go to Pastor Adam about this. This went on for two weeks. Yes, it did, because I'm a great pastor, right? So I'm telling you, this guy had no idea that, that he was talking to another man. Had no idea. He kept it going. I would take screenshots of our conversation. I would post them all online, on Insta, on Twitter, all this kind of stuff. People from around the world were follow, following my hashtag, uh, hashtag days of Darnisha. Darnisha with an E. Days of Darnisha, you can go look it up right now. Days of Darnisha and people were following my conversation. They were like, you're the best pastor in the world. I'm like, I know. So like, this is all happening until one day, Antoine is like, Hey, I wanna talk to you again. I'm gonna call you tonight. Now, I, I, know, I know something Antoine doesn't know. I, I know that he's not gonna recognize me because I'm definitely not Darnisha, you know? And so I, so I go to my wife and I'm like, babe, you gotta pretend to be Dar Darnisha. <laughs> and, she, and, I, and I try to describe Darnisha, I'm like, she's a deep soul. She feels things, but she's not afraid to be out there. She's free as a feather, but you know, at the time she's got some roots to her and you gotta understand her perception. I mean, I'm trying to describe something that doesn't even exist. And, and I remember, my, I'm not convinced my wife can play the role, so I'm like, that's it, no, you can't talk to him on the phone. So he calls and I send my, my, the voicemail to the generic voicemail. He would call and call and call, and then he texts, he's like, I have this weird feeling, but you're acting like a guy. You're like dodging me the whole time. And I'm like, more than you know, homie, more than you know. I, I knew that when Antoine, finally I had to cut off with Antoine, he just wasn't ready. And so I, I, I knew when Antoine was gonna figure out that I was not Nisha by the way that I sounded, perhaps if he saw me by the way that I looked. And I believe the enemy is the same way, that at some point you're gonna figure out he's not as big as he says he is. He's not as strong as you might convince yourself. You are not under attack. I don't care what teaching you're under. I don't care what mentality you subscribe to. When you live under constant attack, it means that there was unfinished business then at the cross. So either the cross was finished or it wasn't. And what you do is you stand in that victory and you stand on God's word and you stand on his promises. And I think there's something about understanding that I'm not under attack, I'm the ambush. I'm not the threatened, I am the threat. I'm the one the enemy loses uh, his sleep about and breaks into a cold sweat about because he knows that I see him for what he really is. Don't you remember Isaiah 14? when it says in the end days that we will look on Satan, we will be shook and shocked that we are gonna say, is this the one that caused havoc on the nations? Is this the one that caused disease to spread? Is this the one that caused suicide, that caused abortion, that caused all kinds of problems in the earth? Is this the one? I say, let's throw the party a little bit early and start saying it now. You are no match for my Jesus. You will never take ground. We serve notice to you. You cannot have this generation. You don't get to have my nation or my family. Are you following me? Where are the woke at? Where are the ones, where are the hungry ones at? Where are the mighty ones at? Where are the fearless ones? Where are the ones that are walking revival that the enemy has no strategy against? Where we are a step ahead in every way. Where we are leading with vision and faith and not just our trophies and our anchors and our self-importance, but we are leading with such hunger and such drive that only comes from a supernatural source. Where are the woke at? If we're gonna be a part of that tribe, if we're gonna carry that mantle, if we're gonna walk in that authority, I wanna give you three things. Three things that the woke say with their life. The first one is, I'm ahead. I'm ahead. I live ahead. I stay ahead. What God does in my life always prepares me a step ahead. 
I had a, I had a student one time, you know, we, we highly valued presence-driven ministry. We, we just, there was just no other feast that we would go to. We highly valued moments with him and what would happen out of that. Now, we, ha- we valued that in a biblical context. Are you with me? And so, we, we, in other words, we didn't want you to be weird or spooky. We wanted you to be an arsenal of heaven, but we didn't want you to have some kind of strangeness to you. Are you following me? And so, uh, but we would have students who would walk in. I remember one time with this guy named Bobby. He, was, he had that prophetic sight. He was what the Bible called a seer. And, and he would see things like, I mean, th- there was times he f- walked in to, to the sanctuary of the back doors and he walked in, he was like this. And, and, and I said, Bobby, what's the matter? He's like, you don't see that? And I'm like, well, apparently I don't because I'm asking. And he says, uh, he says there is floating fire all over this room. And I was preaching, I was starting a sermon series that he did not know about the fire of God. The same kid saw a lion on the stage standing and then opened his mouth and he had his mouth open and he had a rose and he had no idea what he was or who it was. And I had to explain that to him. Are you understanding? We had these supernatural encounters that would happen all the time. I remember this other kid. One time he woke up from a nap and he woke up with such clarity. He woke up and he had had a dream. And in the dream, a big plastic Ziploc bag came to him. He grabbed it and the Lord told him in his dream, I want you to go stand in the pharmacy aisle at Walmart and whoever you lay hands on is going to get completely healed. And so he shows up to Walmart just under straight obedience because that's how we raised him and discipled him. Just straight obedience and surrender. Shows up to Walmart and goes up, forgets the plastic bag and then all of a sudden he just says, okay, Lord, I'm gonna go for it. Steps out in faith and full of risk, but obedience. And this person walks up and he says, hey, listen, I, I saw you just picked up your prescriptions and I'm a Christian. And the Lord told me to come here and pray for people. What can I pray for you about? I mean, it's not like they can say, I don't have anything. I mean, they got a bag full of pills for something, you know? <laughs> so they're, they're like, oh, you know, my, my issue with this, my issue with that. Some of them were saying, oh, I have a high blood pressure. Some of them were saying, you know, I've got back pain. Some of them were saying, you know, I, I, I had this surgery. I had this issue, I, you know, all kinds of stuff. I had this growth and all that. This, I had this rat, one of them had a rash. And he said, well, let me pray. Let me lay hands on you and pray for you. And they're like, okay. This is what I love about lost people. Lost people are like, shoot, man, pray. Christians are like, no, I'm believing for my healing. I'm good. It's so dumb. So that's called the spirit of stupid. And so well, here comes this kid. This kid says, hey, let me pray for you. He prays for this woman. I think she had like something, uh, a, road, a, a, a torn something in her back. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command this back to be healed. And she just begins to feel this warm feeling and she gets totally healed because this kid prays. I mean, she's like, I'm doing what I shouldn't be doing. I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I haven't done in a long time. She's like, I won't need these pills anymore here. And she gives them to the kid. So the kid's like, uh, 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 uh. So uh, someone in Walmart saw, hey, are you praying for people? They were a Christian. They're like, yeah, here, take one of my plastic bags. They're gonna give you pills. And they hand them a Ziploc bag. They hand him a Ziploc bag, and this kid prayed for every person that he had time for, that he came through, every one of them got healed, and every one of them would put these plastic, uh, these pills in this plastic bag to where he came not just one bag, but two bags. He showed up at church, I'm not lying, he showed up at church with two bags, he's like, Pastor Chris, check this out. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? I thought he was trying to sell them and pump them to all the other kids. I'm like, dude, we relapsed, you're saved now, what are you doing? You know, I'm like, and he's like, no, no, and he told me the dream. Why would that happen? Because God spoke to a student who was a 15 year old in his dreams and made him a step ahead so that when he got to Walmart, there was already an encounter, there was already authority that he laid hands on people and he was a step ahead of the enemy and he was a step ahead of the pain and let it be said of Generation for Truth that you were never a step behind, that you were never caught off guard, but you were always ahead. You were always hearing from heaven and responding immediately. The woke stay ahead. The woke don't fall behind, and the woke don't make excuses for it. I like what verse nine and verse 12, it says, Elisha would warn the king of Israel. He was even telling him what the king would say in his bedroom. You know what my prayer has been? Lord, raise up more Elishas. Raise up the type of men and women who would hear about wicked plots or wicked plans in the natural and in the spiritual, and who would fight them off simply by their speaking of a word. 
What would it be like if we had a 13 year old who knew how to pray and have intercession and God would begin to say, you need to contact the right authorities because a terrorist plot is being activated in this city at this time. And they got in touch with the right people and they were able to stop a mass genocide or a mass killing. You know what I would say? That's the woke. That's a step ahead. What would it be like if God started giving you strategies? You know, I feel like I see someone here with a journal and it, I, I, I see a brown leather journal with the ties around it and it's all these strategies and, and, and these methods and you're wondering, God, why are you giving this to me? I'm not the person that needs to carry this. I'm not the right touch. I don't have the right skill because God is overloading you and overdosing you with promise and strategy and fulfillment because there will come a day where, where you look on those books and you will look on those notes and you will be a step ahead. It's not an accident you're having the dreams you are right now. You may be 15 having those dreams and God said, I'm gonna activate it when you're 25. You may be 18 when you're writing down what you're gonna do with your life and God says, prepare, 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 but I am going to activate this when you turn 30. There are things that God is showing you about your future spouse so that when someone who comes along who kind of looks like it but doesn't totally have what God wants them to have, you will know who you're supposed to be with and who you're not supposed to be with because you're a step ahead. Or you understand what I'm telling you? It's time for the woke to rise. I'm not talking those who are full of conspiracies. God's not giving out proposals and suggestions. He is releasing strategies. He is releasing understanding. He is releasing fresh vision. And only the woke, those who understand how to live from heaven to earth, will begin to see things like they're supposed to see them in the spirit. Have you noticed, just let, let me put it in our world for a second. Have you noticed there are people who are totally moving forward in this current state where the world's at today. You can totally tell a difference between those who are moving forward in faith and those who are not. You can tell who's moving forward in a trust with God and who's in pure panic. And then the ones who are in pure panic because they're so Christianized, they're being overly cautious and they call that wisdom when it's really just fear. I'm, you're right, Pastor Chris, that's good, that's a good word. Either, either I'm touching a nerve or I feel like God is highlighting some things in our lives. I really believe that God is trying to wake up a generation because it's time that you stay a step ahead. Here's the second thing that the woke say with their life. Number two, remember number one, I'm ahead. Number two, I'm an ambush. I'm an ambush. I, I remember one time I was, uh, I, I, I was in my office and I had my office door closed and just outside my office is where my assistant sat. And, um, and, and, and I remember my doors closed, I'm in my office by myself and all of a sudden I hear this lady like crying and, and like crying, yelling, crying, talking loud, not screaming, but just hysterical. And, and she comes in and she goes, is, it, is this Pastor Chris's office? Is this uh, uh, Pastor Chris Estrada's office? I, I need to talk to Pastor Chris. Is this Pastor Chris's office? My assistant, she's El Salvadorian, so she comes with all the spicy, you know what I'm saying? So she, they're like, can I, she's like, can I talk to Pastor Chris? And she goes, uh, excuse me, what you wanna talk to Pastor Chris for? I mean, she's, I mean, she's spicy, right? And so, so uh, this lady's like, well, listen, I, I was told to come out here, and she starts explaining the story. Well, in the middle of her explaining the story, I go up to the door. Pastor, Lord, I go to the door, and I do what any man of God does in this situation. I locked the door, because <laughs> I was like, I don't know who's out there, right? And I remember, I'll never forget, I remember I put my ear to the door. Guys, I was, at this point, you probably should make sense. If, I was having death threats. We had a Satanist show up at our house and start leaving bones and pentagram. They're stupid. They do this stuff all the time. Like, they, like they, one time we had someone fly into Dallas and, and ha put a list, wall, interrupt one of our classes, had about four or 500 students in it, and there was a list of three names. I'm here to, on this campus to kill these people by the order of Satan, and I was one of those three names. So yes, I locked the door. I was like, well, if things pop off, I'm gonna be ready. You know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> So I walk up, I lock the door, and I remember I'm overhearing, and this lady says, I was driving in my car, and he preached at a church about an hour from here two years ago, and I have listened to that message every Monday for the last two years. I'm thinking, this poor woman has had to hear me preach for two years the same message. I don't even think it was a good message. And so she, she like, she, she's like, and I was driving, 
and a voice came in my car and said, go to this address and Pastor Chris will meet with you. He has something to tell you. Now, let me be full on honest. I didn't know he was gonna do that. Like, I, I woke up that morning. I was in my Bible that morning. I prayed that morning. God didn't bring it up. Hey, crazy woman coming your way. Be on the look. I didn't see none of that. I didn't know any of that. So I'm hearing him say that, and I'm like, you said what? You want me to do what? I said, Lord, I'm not ready for that. He said, don't worry about it. I said, Lord, I'm not ready. He said, I'm ready. He said, and when I'm ready, that's when you're ready. And I was like, but that, that's cute, but like, I'm not ready. I don't feel this. And, I, and I, I, I told the Lord, I said, I feel like I'm being blindsided. He said, don't worry about it. We're the ambush. That's literally what he said. So I opened up the door and she's like, I need to talk, Pastor. I said, ma'am, listen, I'm in here. I said, come on in, please. And I told my assistant, you come too. <laughs> and so I remember we're in there. She starts telling me her story. She says, you know, I, I heard you preach at this church and I downloaded the podcast and I've been listening to it for two years. She said, but I just found out this last weekend that I'm about to have my fourth divorce. I've got kids with all these different daddies. I just can't seem to make relationships work. I can't seem to move forward in my life. And I feel like I'm constantly overwhelmed and I'm under attack and I don't know what to do. And I'm trying to find the good in this. And all the time she's talking, I feel an authority. I feel an alignment. I feel a moment. Come on, you know when God has marked a moment. I feel a moment happening right here. And I turned to her and I said, ma'am, listen. I said, it's very apparent to me that the truth is you may love God, but you're not in love with God and there's a big difference. And you have not totally surrendered your life to him. But he's so good and he's so patient that he's marked out this moment. And I believe it wasn't just some voice, it was the Lord Jesus that came into your car, gave you my address, you found me on our big college campus and here we are having this conversation because he is ambushing all the problems, all the issues, all the struggles and all the pain in your life and I believe it's time that you give your life to Jesus Christ. She starts weeping on my couch, I mean uncontrollably, and we start casting devils out of this woman in my office, why? Because Holy Spirit was the ambush. This is what happens when you're woke. You may not have all the plans, you may not know all the next steps. You may not even understand all the reasons, but if you walk under the cloud, if you walk with God, if you follow his leading, you are gonna go behind enemy lines many times. You are gonna feel bombarded or blindsided, but let it never be said that I was attacked, I was the ambush, and I was woke, and I was a step ahead, and God was with me. Is anybody else getting this tonight? I think it's time that we had a woke generation. I'm not talking about a cultural woke. I'm not talking about just a propaganda woke. I'm talking about a supernaturally woke. You know, it's interesting to me. Notice in verse 16, notice what Elisha prays for. It says in verse 16, don't be afraid, Elisha told his servant, for there are more with us than against us. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Can I put, many times what would help us in our Bible is if we notice what it did not say. Notice what Elisha never prayed for. Notice what he didn't intercede for. He never said, Lord, protect us. He never said, Lord, deliver us. He never questioned, Lord, are you with us? Because Elisha lived with an understanding and increased spiritual awareness that it's not, my problem is not this army. Elisha's biggest problem was his blind servant. It's amazing how people can see and still be blind. You're like, what are you talking about? Well, let's talk about your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. It got real quiet all of a sudden. People were telling, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Your heart gets broken. Now I'm woke. Let's talk about that financial decision you shouldn't have made. People are like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Is that a good habit? Is that a good habit? Then you get burned. Now you're woke. Are you following me? Yeah. I think there's something about staying awake to the realities of heaven. I, I, it, notice what he didn't pray for. He didn't pray, Lord, would you deliver us? Would you protect us? He was literally saying, Lord, open his eyes. Could it be just saying, that God is opening up a generation's eyes 
with a global situation and crisis so that we could find our lane and our path. We could find our purpose in the middle of all kinds of opposition, all kinds of trouble, all kinds of problems, and yet God birthed the purpose in it. Could it be that we're not being tested right now, we're being trusted right now? Because God could have put this on any generation in any season, yet he put it in our time, in our life. Are you following me? Is this making sense? I believe there's something about the woke. Let, let, me, let, me, let me take this a little deeper. It's interesting. Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes. The guy's eyes is open and he sees that the hillside is full of chariots of horses and fire. So he wasn't blind in the natural. He was just blind in the supernatural. He could not see what the prophet saw or what God was showing, which is the why the prophet said, there are more with us than against us. Let me, let me take it a little bit further. As soon as this wicked army sees that Elisha and his servant can tell they are not intimidated by them, they start to advance, and then Elisha, it literally says Elisha uh, commands, Lord, strike them with blindness. I mean. Let me put it in our world. Elisha became the biggest flashbang you have ever seen in your Call of Duty life and totally blinded a whole army. Now, why is this so important? Because what God is showing us is that one man with sight is more powerful than a blind army. I believe that God has given you vision. He's given you sight. He's peeling back the layers, the scales, the veils from your eyes, and he's starting to show you purpose and destiny unfiltered like never before. It's totally with the mandate of Jesus. Okay, I remember one time I was preaching. I was preaching at a denomination that didn't believe in the move of the Spirit. But they called me and said, hey, Pastor Chris, would you, um, would you come and speak out at, 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 at our school? This is college, would you come speak at our school? And I was like, I'll go speak anywhere because I'm not called to one, I'm not called to parts of his body, I'm called to his whole body, right? And I'm not gonna be prejudiced, so I'll go anywhere. I said, but you know, I know doctrinally, y'all roll like this, and I'm gonna come in, and I'm gonna roll like this, and I'm not sure we're gonna meet. They're like, no, we, that's exactly what we want. We want you to come. And we like you, and this is what they said, we like you because you're not weird. <laughs> they just don't know me well enough. <laughs> so, so, which is fine. So I get in there, man, I start preaching on the heart of God and revival and what God's doing in the earth, sharing stories, all this kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, people are getting filled with the Spirit. People are getting encountered by God. I'm telling you, people are waking up off the floor in visions. I mean, people are, I mean, it's power overload. And this went on for about four or five days. I mean, it just was extended meetings, night services. I mean, it was powerful, it was incredible. Well. The guy who leads the headmaster of this school, his son had just returned from Princeton University with his doctorate in theology. And he said, hey, my, my son wants to meet with you. He just returned from Princeton. You know, he's got his uh, doctorate in theology. I'm like, dope, let's meet. I said, let's go to this Starbucks and we'll sit down. So, sorry, we went to a Starbucks, love it, sorry. So, so we went to Starbucks. I'm sitting there and, and I'm scrolling through my phone, probably on Instagram, and I, I'm scrolling through my phone and this guy walks up and he does, I mean, this guy is socially inept. You could tell this dude was single from a mile away, all right? This dude walks up and he's got khaki pants on, he got a polo uh, uh, top shelf button, and he got a sweater hanging around his neck, uh, like this, right? And so, I remember, he walks up to me, he doesn't say hi, introduce himself, ask for my name, he just sits down, he goes, so, tell me what your thesis is on the five Nathaniel truths. Tell me about how Daniel 7 correlates with Revelation chapter four. Tell me about the experience here, tell me about how this in the garden, all the way to here, I'm like, hey, 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 hey. I said, you most socially inept person I've ever met in my life. I bet you're single, you live with your parents, don't you? I said, listen, I said, first off, my name's Chris, I got kids, what's your name? And he said, oh, my name is such and such. I said, listen, let's skip the interrogation because you obviously came here with really one or two questions to ask me. So what is it? You know what he asked me? He said, how do you hear the voice of God? <laughs> Sorry, I know I shouldn't be like, but he said, how do you hear the voice of God? And I'm like, well, I don't know, you're the doctor, you tell me. And he said, well, I just, I, I don't, I, I'm not really, I just, I'm not sure, I, I feel real inadequate. I, 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 I said, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You tell me you got a, a doctorate in theology. He said, yeah. 
I said, so you know the Word of God? He said, yeah. So you know the Word of God? You just don't know the God of the Word? Is that what you're telling me? I said, how much did you pay for that? He said, $200,000. I said, $200,000? I said, that's a house. I said, I laid my hands on it. I said, you're going to get 200,000s right now. You're going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're going to get 200,000 right now. They cheated you. So I laid my hands on him. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit at Starbucks and got completely filled. And I'm telling you, why? I'm not impressed by how much you know. You think this world really cares who you can quote? They don't want your tweetable life. They want your livable life. They don't want your one-liners anymore. They don't want your cute illustrations. They don't want your programs, your three steps to this. What they want is a fresh encounter with God, a biblical worldview, and an integrity to match it up, regardless of how cool you look and how sweet you look, regardless of what might be going on in your life, you still stand firm on the promises of God. That's what it means to be ahead. That's what it means, I'm an ambush. It's totally the mandate of Jesus to open up the eyes of the blind. Don't you remember the messianic declaration that even he himself read out of the scroll of Isaiah? He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me and he has anointed me to preach the good news to those who are captive, and watch this, and restore sight to the blind. He never once mentioned deaf ears. Lame will walk. He just says, restore sight to the blind. Now, we think that's natural sight. That's not what he's talking about. He is talking about, I am going to restore spiritual sight that was lost in the garden that is going to be, that's going to be renewed when I die and I'm going to give you supernatural sight. Isn't it interesting that the fall of man happened in a garden and yet the redemption of man began in the garden of Gethsemane because all God was doing was orchestrating spiritual sight to come back to his sons and daughters so we don't live intimidated, so we're not panicked and we're not feared and we're not living with limitations. We're not living as the exception. We are living as a follower of pure Jesus' heart. Are you following me? That's what it means to be woke. Look at what God does. You find it all throughout scripture. God is constantly opening people's eyes. He goes to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'll make you a great and mighty nation. Abraham's like, ah, I'm not sure because we've been married 25 years and she ain't yet. So what are we doing? I ain't got no babies. I ain't got no inheritance. I ain't got no heirs. And God says, come here, boy. He says, go stand outside and I want you to count all the stars in the sky. So, you know, Abe, he goes out there and he's like, one, two, three. I can't count in Hebrew. You know, he starts counting. Eventually he loses count. If it were me, I'd lose track of which star I counted. Anybody else struggle with that? So he sits there and he goes in this conversation with God and says, God, there's no way. I can't count them all. And then God says, so will your descendants be. I am opening your eyes. He's giving him spiritual sight. Do you remember when Joshua is about to invade the promised land? Do you remember this? And he meets Jesus. It says the angel of the Lord's armies meets him with his sword drawn. And Joshua says, are you for us or for our adversaries? And the Lord literally says, no. But as now angel of the Lord's armies, commander of the Lord's armies, I have now come to show you, see, I have given you Jericho. They hadn't even fought one battle, hadn't come on one enemy, but he's opened his spiritual eyes. Are you seeing this? Come on, I said, are you seeing this? What was it that happened to Paul when he was Saul on the road to Damascus? It says when he saw Jesus, he was blinded. But when, when, when Ananias walks in and lays hands on him in Acts chapter nine, what fell from his eyes? Scales. What are they talking about? Spiritual blindness. You, you'll, you have to understand Jesus when he heals a blind man. Do you remember this? It says that he prays twice. Anybody else remember this in your Bible? It says he goes, Jesus, first off, Jesus gets away with everything. This man spits in the dirt makes some mud, and rubs it in someone's eye. I'm thinking if I spat in the dirt, if I made some mud and put it in your eye, you're gonna punch me in the throat. <laughs> so Jesus does this, rubs it in his eyes, and then says, open your eyes, and what do you see? This man, watch this, says, I see men walking around like trees. And then Jesus says, okay, let's pray again. Prays again, spits in the dirt, makes some mud, puts it back in his eyes, and he says, what do you see? He says, I see clearly. Now, a lot of people think that that is a progressive healing. That's not a progressive healing. What Jesus was doing was opening his spiritual eyes first, then his natural eyes. 
Because if you look through your Bible, you will find that people are always likened to trees throughout your Bible. All right, Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit because a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. He's not talking about good and bad trees. He's talking about good and bad people. Are you following me? What about Psalms chapter two? I'm sorry, Psalms chapter one, verse one. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seats of the scornful. Verse two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. Watch this, verse three. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its season and whose leaves are also not to wither and whatever he does will prosper. Are you seeing this? What did he do for this man? It's not that Jesus didn't get it right the first time. He healed his spiritual sight and then he healed his natural sight. Are you seeing this? I believe what God is doing for many of us in this room is healing the spiritual sight because there's something about the way the world is right now that causes you to feel uncomfortable. And you wonder if you're being critical or cynical, but it's a holy discomfort because you are a holy disruption. And there's something about the foster care system that you don't like because you see that it's blowing more holes in people than it is helping. There's something about abortion that bothers you like nothing else. There's something about abuse or addictions or failed marriages that just sits on you wrong, not because you're irritated, but you are spiritually assigned to go and heal all of those issues, solve all of those problems and bring clarity because you don't just see things in the natural, you see things in the spiritual. This is what it means to be ahead, to be an ambush. And to close out tonight, if we're gonna stay woke, Number three, the woke say, I'm a, I'm a head, I'm an ambush, and number three, I'm an answer. I'm an answer. I had a young lady in our youth ministry, her name was Keisha, and a uh, student of ours, excuse me, and she, she, um, she, we would always send our students to go pray for people. We all, you know, we, we trained, look, we were the type that we didn't just present the gospel, we demonstrated the gospel. It makes no sense for us to preach a good message and you don't demonstrate God's goodness, especially out in the streets, in the marketplace, all of that. And so we would always present, but then we'd demonstrate. And one of the ways that we trained our students to do that was through treasure hunts. And so if you don't know what a treasure hunt is, we would ask the Lord for words of knowledge to give us direction on who he wanted to, us to pray for and who we wanted to love on and encounter. So I remember uh, we're getting ready to uh, take a treasure hunt and send out teams to go minister and pray for people. I can't tell you how many times when we did these, I mean, people would get healed, people would get delivered, all of them would end up getting saved. I mean, it was powerful. There were times when we were rejected. There were times when people said, no, don't pray for them. There were times when people said, get away from me, I don't believe in that. But I'm telling you, the times where we had a breakthrough was worth the thousand times we were told no. I mean, we, we had times where we would take our teams and we would set up at yogurt shops. I don't know why, but our students love yogurt, whatever. And so they would go to these yogurt shops, frozen yogurt, and they would put up a sign that said free spiritual readings and dream interpretation, which is really just prophetic words and dream interpretation, right? The gift of discernment. So they would come in, they would sit down at the table and uh, people, they would tell the owner of that yogurt shop and said, hey, can we do this for two hours on this night? And the, and the guy's like, yeah, because they would have a line wrapped around the building to get in, not to buy yogurt, but to sit at this table. And they, since they were in there, they would buy yogurt. So the owner was like, hey, dope, I'm making money. And we were like, hey, great, we're having breakthrough. Win-win. I mean, this, this, this is just what our youth group did. This is, what we, this is how we grew. It was powerful. I'll never forget Keisha one day. She says, hey, I, Pastor Chris, I gotta submit this to you. This is a, this is a strange one. I said, okay. She said, um, she says, you know, I was praying. The Lord spoke to me. He says, he wants me to go pray for a blind woman that's gonna be pumping gas in her car uh, uh, as she drives off or as she's gonna drive in and pump gas in her car. I have to play for, pray for this blind woman. I said, did you hear what you just said? What the heck is a blind woman doing driving a car? And she said, well, that's what I, I said. Do you feel purpose in this? She's like, I can't get away from this. This is God. I said, well, let's go for it. I, I'd rather take the risk than not. I said, what's the worst? She's just gonna sit at a gas station for a couple hours. So, so she sits there, hour goes by, hour and a half goes by, two hours goes by. Keisha is about to leave. And all of a sudden, 
as she's watching every car, this car like jumps the curb, Arr! just like that. Boom, jumps the curb, and then like fishtails, like Tokyo Drift, Arr! right next to this gas pump. And this woman gets out of the car and she's like, thank you, Jesus. Oh, he's my say, oh, he's my shield. He protected me today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank and Keith's just like, I wonder if that's her. You know, because she's got these big glasses on, you know, like the bottoms of Coke bottles and stuff. She gets out, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, she's trying to put the number, push the numbers and all that. Kind of, thank you, Jesus, right? Keisha walks over and she goes, um, excuse me, ma'am. And she goes, yes, baby. And she said, uh, ma'am, listen, um, my name's Keisha. Uh, God told me to come out here and pray for people because he told me that a woman named this, is this your name? She's like, yes, child. And she said, um, I, I was supposed to pray for you because you're blind. And this woman goes, ooh, that's my Jesus. Look at him working in my life right there. I knew I was supposed to come. I knew I was supposed to be here. And she, and Keisha's like, so can I pray for her? She's like, shoot, child, you better pray and not bring that weak stuff over here. She lays hands, Keisha lays hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, open these eyes. Simple prayer. No negotiation. I'm not negotiating what Jesus died for. I can enforce what Jesus died for. Lord, open her eyes. She's just, boom, just like this. Lord, open her eyes. She opens her eyes and she goes, no way. Look at my Jesus. And she starts making G uh, Keisha dance with her. She come on, come on, come on, come on. And they start dancing. God totally heals her eyes at this gas pump. Now, yeah, come on. Why would that happen? Because somebody was an answer. Come to find out that this woman was supposed to be driven to an eye surgery she was about to have that day. Her ride canceled, she had access to a car, her car, and she drove her car just believing if I can just get to the eye surgery. She was gonna have a natural eye surgery, but God was invading with a supernatural encounter surgery and God was restoring her sight. And I feel like that's in this room tonight. I feel like where you've been blind or where you've been nearsighted or farsighted, where you feel like you've been ambushed or lied or bamboozled, wherever you have been and you don't see the will of God, I feel like God's restoring sight in this room right now. Would you stand up with me? Can I just give you some vision tonight? Because the truth is, come Wednesday, I get on a plane and I go home. But you gotta live this thing out. You gotta walk this, I can't do this for you just like you can't live out the destiny I'm supposed to live. We all gotta carry it, which means we, gotta, we all have to have our own sight. I mean, when you, there, there is certain sight that, that Slavic can have for you, George can have for you. But at the end of the day, if you don't learn to trust what he shows you, you will never be beneficial in the kingdom of God because you will always need a man or a woman to validate what he showed you. But if you learn to submit to authority and that authority tells you how to be familiar with God's voice, how to recognize how he talks, his ways, the reasons, even his timing, and you become mature in this, guess what happens? God's assignments start flooding your thoughts. He starts putting encounters in your life and he starts releasing something fresh, all because you got woke. I, I mean, let me just give you some vision for a second. David could have complained about his lions and bears, but it was lions and bears that prepared him for giants. Are you following? Peter was a fisherman because it was practice for being a fisher of men. Saul, the apostle Paul, was a tent maker because it was practice on how to build a church and what was sustainable, what would hold the weight of God's presence. Are you following me? Could it be that what you're going through right now, you are literally, God, would you stop this? And he's like, I'm using this. <laughs> this don't preach well in America. Because <laughs> we want our bubble and we want our comforts and we want our understanding and we want to have our blessed life now and I'm all for that. But at the end of the day, there will be moments where I just have to trust him. And I've made up my mind, even when it comes to scripture, I either believe, I'm gonna believe what his word says, whether it's sweet or bitter to my heart, whether it cuts me or heals me. Are you following me? I'm gonna believe this book. If people say it's outdated, if people say it, it's not relevant, I don't care. 
Because even though they might doubt everything in the word, nothing else has healed me. Nothing else has sustained me. Nothing else has possessed me with his promises. Nothing else has encouraged me. Nothing else has helped me have a great marriage. Raising my kids, living the life I have. Yes, I love my church. Man, I'm so grateful for my pastors and my spiritual fathers and mothers. But man, if I didn't have his word and I didn't recognize his voice, I would be lost and broken. And I believe that what God is doing is there a spiritual eye surgery? I feel like the word for tonight is God is getting your sight right tonight. If you say, Pastor Chris, you're speaking right to me. Now, I, I wanna pray for a couple, two groups of people. There might be people in this room, this might be your first time, and you have never stepped in a room like this. You're like, man, y'all sing songs for an hour. <laughs> and then there were times like 15 minutes, you guys were all quiet and I didn't know what to do. And then you got this loud Mexican coming up here. And he's all kinds of passionate. But while he's talking, I feel something in my heart. I, I want what he has. I want what, what everyone in this room has. You, this may be your first time or your second time or your first time in a long time. But there's such a claim in this room. Where heaven is reaching out. He's grabbing a hold of your heart. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've never made him Lord of your life, and you feel like this is your moment, I'm telling you, this is the timing of God, this is your moment, if that's you, and you've never given your life to Jesus, but you want to tonight, would you raise your hand? I wanna pray with you. Pastor Chris, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I don't know who it is. I will never do a message where I don't do this. So if there's no one to raise your hand, you're not gonna hurt my heart. But I, there might be, there might be, there might be. I feel like, I don't know. You know what I feel? I feel like someone would watch this message weeks from now, months from now, years from now. And it would be so impacting you because of the presence of Jesus. And he would be tugging on your heart and then we would be in this moment, though you're not here live, you're watching it recorded. And I believe the Spirit of God is touching your life. And this is your moment. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, take your hand, put it on your heart. I don't want you to repeat these prayers. And I'm gonna ask the whole church in this room, would you, in volume and in strength, in passion, repeat after me as we've got people perhaps in this room or watching uh, live or later say Jesus I give you my life I thank you that you died for me that you rose again and you're alive today I surrender my life to you give me vision I want to see what you see and I want to see how you see in your name I pray, amen, amen. Come on, can we give it up for people who have the opportunity to give their life to Jesus? There's something about perspective, right? That when you see things from a different or new or fresh perspective, it just causes all things to feel different, right? I, I, if I've ever had a problem and I, I go to Pastor Adam, and he says, well, have you ever thought about this? And he just offers new perspective out of the gift of wisdom. You, you understand what I'm telling you? I'll never forget, as we were standing in Peru, we were in the largest stadium in South and Central America. It was 90,000 people that packed out this stadium and there wasn't one name advertised, only Jesus. Just one name, only Jesus. There wasn't any man or any band advertised. There was lines of buses of people trying to get in the stadium. And I'll never forget when God spoke to our executive team. I get to run with, you saw four of my brothers up there. There's five of us that lead missions me. We lead as a team. And, and I'll never forget when God spoke to us and said, these four nations that you've gone to, that was practice for America. It took us 64 stadium events to get us to one in LA next year. It took us 
thousands. Ten, we brought 10,000 people from 43 different nations, 150 organizations represented in Peru in July of, uh, June of last year. Are you following me? And God was saying, all of that was practice for America. I believe that some of you have walked through some rainy days, some challenging times, some great victories. You've seen the hand of God move. Come on, this is generation for truth. You're not new to this because it's practice. All of that that you were walking, it was practice to get you to hear so that you could be battle tested, so that you would not be rookie status. You would not be a beginner, an amateur, but you would literally be so war tested, so battle hardened, if you will, so ready because you had practiced on your lions and bears. You had practiced fishing. You had practiced tent making. It's amazing what God can do to raise up an entire army. You thought you were just working your little job and God's saying, it's practice. And I'm here to tell you and wake you up everything that you have been through to this moment right now, that was just practice for what God's releasing right now. It's time to get your sight right. If you say, Pastor Chris, I want fresh vision. I want, I, I want my eyes to be open. I don't want to see the armies. I want to see the hills full of chariots and horses of fire. I don't want to go in the promised land and be focused on giants. I don't see giants. I see grapes. Are you following me? I'm getting my sight right. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know who needs it. I don't know who I'm here for, but I know I'm here on purpose because God is aligning divine sight. And if that's you, you say, Pastor Chris, I wanna pray. Uh, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Raise your hand, who am I talking to? That says, I need fresh perspective. I need vision. I need the sight of heaven. I need to see things from God's throne. I need to see things through God's resources. I need to see things through God's timing. It was just practice. 10 years from now, my, my teens were practiced for my 20s. My 20s were practiced for my 30s. My 30s were practiced for nations. I practiced on my campuses, on my high school or my college. I practiced on a campus so that I could learn how to take a city. I practiced on the mall so I could learn to take Wall Street. Are you following me? I practiced on cities so I could learn to take nations. It's all practice. You're not in the trouble you think you're in. You're not in the issues you think you're in. You're not in the problems you think you're in because there is a God in heaven who is with you and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you and God is not changing his mind about you tonight.